Hello, my name is Kyle Adamson. I am the pastor here at Songs of Hope Church, and I am so glad you have joined us here today for our online service. I want to let you know a couple of things, that if you have prayer requests or concerns or comments, please put those in the, in the notes section below. We'd love to communicate with you and be praying for you throughout this week. If you would like to give an offering back for all the great things that God has blessed you in your life, there is a link to our online giving below as well. I want to let you know that we meet here every Thursday night at 6.30 p.m. at Songs of Hope Church at 102 South 9th Street in Beach Grove. We would love for you to be our guest here, and we're happy that you joined us online. We hope you enjoy our service today. May God bless you. I want to start off tonight by sharing a story. A long time ago, there was a very famous Russian man named Rudolph. And Rudolph was very famous in his village because he was really good at predicting the weather. In fact, he was really good at predicting when rain was coming. Well, he was getting ready to go on the 6, on the 6 p.m. news that he always did every day. And this day he got on there and predicted a very harsh rainstorm that was coming in the middle of the night in that village. In fact, it was so harsh, he said it's going to be flooding like this village has never seen before. And so he gets home. And his wife automatically starts arguing with him, says, Rudolph, how can you say it's going to rain? There's no rain in sight. We haven't seen a cloud in days. There's no way it's going to rain. I, I know that you have these predictions, and I know they, they always come right. And I know you love your Russian heritage, but there's no way it's going to rain. You're, you're wrong this time. And he said, no, I, I know my Russian heritage has never let me down. I know it's going to rain tonight. And they argued like this for hours. And finally, they even went to bed angry because they just couldn't agree. And, and Rudolph was sure it was going to rain. Well, middle of the night, it was a torrential rainstorm. Nothing that this town had ever seen. And they both get up in the morning. They look out the window and see that there's water all around. Rudolph kind of looks at his wife and says, I told you it's going to rain. She looks at him and says, how did you know? There's no way you could have known this. How did you know it was going to rain? I don't understand it. He looks at her and says, you know, Rudolph always knows, knows when it's going to rain, dear. Sorry, that was, you had to, yeah, all right. So we're talking. I thought, I read it this week. I thought it was funny, but anyhow, thank you. All right, we're talking about predictions tonight. We're talking about people thousands of years ago that predicted a baby was going to come, a savior coming into this world, and we're going to find out tonight everything they predicted came true exactly as they predicted. Peter Stoner is the chairman of the Departments of Mathematics and Astronomy at Pasadena College, and he's passionate about biblical prophecies. With 600 students from the Intravarsity Christian Fellowship, Stoner looked at eight specific prophecies about Jesus. They came up with extremely conservative probabilities for each one of these to be fulfilled, and then considered the likelihood of Jesus fulfilling all eight of these prophecies. The conclusion to the research was staggering. The, he said the prospect that anyone would satisfy those eight prophecies was 1 in 10 with 17 zeros, which is 1 in 10 quintillion. In science speaks, he describes it like this. Let us try to visualize this chance. If you take 1 in 10 tickets and place, them, or place those tickets in a hat, you thoroughly stir them up, and then you ask a blindfold to pick one out, well, he's got a 1 in 10 chance of picking the right one. Suppose now we take 10 quintillion silver dollars and lay them over the face of Texas. They will cover the state to two feet deep. Now mark one of these silver dollars and stir, so you mark one of those dollars, and you stir up the whole two feet of coins all over the state. So just think of Beach Grove. Think of Indiana. If you're walking and there's two feet of coins, now we're talking about Texas. All these coins and one is marked. Blindfold a man, tell him that he can travel as far as he wishes, but he must, must pick up the one silver coin, and say, I got the right one. Well, what chance would he have of getting the right one? Well, the same chance that the prophets would have had by writing these eight prophecies and having them all come true from one man, from their, their day to the present time, providing that they wrote this in their own wisdom, which is impossible, right? But that's what we're talking about, these prophecies that came true from our Old Testament or, or the, the um the, the law and the prophets, as Jesus described them. So we have the Israelites 
who was God's chosen people from the Old Testament that had been told by a number of prophets about a Savior that was going to come into the world, a Messiah. And they were so excited they couldn't wait for this Savior to come because they wanted to be taken, or they, they wanted to be, um, taken away from their captives. They wanted to be saved from the turmoil and, the, the, and the, the captives around them. So they were waiting for the Savior to come, and they didn't know when it was going to come. But God had their own plan. See, these, these people had a plan of how they thought God would bring the Savior, the Messiah. They thought this, this warrior coming in on a white horse to come to fight and, and take down all of their enemies. But God had a different plan. But to truly understand the impact of the birth of Christ and this Christmas that we're celebrating this, then we need to fast forward actually to the end. We're going to look at scripture from the end of Jesus' ministry. We're going to look at Luke 24, starting with verse 13. Now, just to give you a little bit of context of what's going on, so this is, the, this is what we usually celebrate at Easter here. This is when Jesus had been killed on the cross, he'd been crucified, and now Martha and Mary were going to the grave to take spices uh, and, and fragrances to the grave, and they find out the grave, the, the stone is rolled away, there's nobody there, and they're told by an angel that Jesus is no longer there, he's, he's alive. And they go back to tell the other disciples who have been wondering what was going to happen next. And then Peter and John, they run to the, the, the cave and they try to find out where Jesus is. So this is following this. Now Luke is, I love the, the gospel of Luke. So you have the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that share about the life of Jesus and, and everything that he uh, did in his ministry. And Luke was the physician. He investigated, he interviewed all the eyewitnesses who were around the life of Jesus to find out what was it really like, what really happened. And I'm imagining when he uh, it talks about this, he interviewed the people that were on this particular walk. It says that same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. So just to put this in visual aspect, I'm going to walk a little bit. So just imagine that we're going on a walk. So a couple of his disciples are going on a walk, seven miles, that's a long walk. So they're going to be on this road for a while. They had probably been at Jerusalem because they had, been, they had the Passover that they had celebrated, and so they were probably walking back from this time. Well, as they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. There was a lot of that had just happened in the town. As they walked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came, beyond, or, or came along and began walking with him. So I feel like this little ninja, ninja Jesus comes up and stands right beside him, and they wonder, where did this guy come from? But they just keep walking. Somebody came out of the blue and walked with him. But God kept them from recognizing him. So God specifically did not want him to be recognized yet. And he asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? As if he didn't know. They stopped short. Sadness, sadness was all over their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only one in Jerusalem who hasn't heard of all these things that have happened in these last few days. It's like, where have you been, man? I mean, the whole town's been talking about this. What things, Jesus asked. Now, I can just imagine, I, I love to imagine what it would be like to be there. I can just imagine Jesus with a little smirk on his face, just thinking, what, what happened? Tell me about it. I'm not really sure what happened. They stopped short, or I'm sorry, okay, what things Jesus asked. So the things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles. He was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and the religious leaders, they handed him over to be condemned for death, or to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped, we really hoped that this guy was the one, that he was going to be the Messiah, that he would come to rescue Israel. These happened three days ago, so they had in their minds what was going to happen and how God was going to do the rescuing. They were determined that the Messiah was going to be somebody that was going to take down the Roman Empire, the people who had been um, putting them down all these years. Well, then some of the women from our group of the followers were at his tomb early this morning. The, the men continued to talk. And they came back with this amazing report. They said the body was missing. They had seen angels who told him that this Jesus is alive. And some of our men, they ran out to see, and sure enough, his body was gone, as the women had said. Then Jesus said to them, you foolish people. He goes, you find it so hard to believe that the, what the prophets wrote in the scriptures? He said, wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all of these things before entering his glory? 
Now, this is something that Jesus talked about. These two men weren't a part of his 12 disciples, but they were followers of Jesus throughout his ministry. And so they would have known, they would have heard about these prophecies. You know, Jesus talked about this often in his ministry. And all the prophets that they would have been trained on from a childhood on up would have been told of all the things that would be happening, that would have to happen to the Messiah. And Jesus is saying, you don't know the connection? You didn't see the connection here? And by the time they were nearing Emmaus, the end of the journey, or I'm sorry, actually I missed verse 27. Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses. So they had a long time, and he went through all the teaching of, of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things that was concerning himself. And by the time they were nearing Emmaus to the end of their journey, Jesus acted as if he were just going to keep on walking. But they begged him. They said, stay the night with us since it's getting late. So he went in with them. So he, they must have really enjoyed his conversation. They wanted to continue this talk as they sat down to eat. He took the bread and he blessed it. He, then he gave it, he, he broke it and he gave it to them. And now these men would not have been in the upper room when Jesus broke the bread as he gave it to his other disciples, but something happened and we don't know what. Maybe they saw the holes in his hands and scars from being on the cross, but something happened where their eyes were opened. Because it says suddenly their eyes were open and they recognized him at this time. But from that very moment, he disappeared. Now, how he disappeared, I don't know. I don't know if it's like one of those magician tricks where you throw a, a, a thing down, a cloud of smoke comes up and he was gone. But Jesus, he's God. He can come and go as he wants. And so they said to him, they said to each other, didn't our hearts burn as, we, as he talked with us on the way to the, on the road and explained the scriptures to us? How do we not know this, they're saying. And within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. So even though they'd just been on this long walk, that's a long walk, and they would have been exhausted. They were so excited that they would walk with Jesus. They had to go tell everybody as soon as they could. And within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. They found the 11 disciples and the others who had gathered with them who said, The Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. So, Preaching.com tells us that when Jesus was sharing with the disciples on the road to Emmaus, he could have been sharing the prophecies surrounding his birth. Jesus could not have fo forced these prophecies to happen. These were God-ordained prophecies that spoke to God's ability to work out the smallest details from where Jesus was born to the unique circumstances of his birth to the actions of his parents where he or when he was born. In fact, here are several of the Old Testament prophecies that were fulfilled concerning Jesus' birth. We see from the first book of the Bible, Genesis 22, 18 tells us all the nations would be blessed through Abraham's offspring, which they were. Numbers 24, 17 tells us Jesus would be from the line of Jacob, which he was. Isaiah 11, 1 tells us Jesus would be from the line of Jesse, which he was. Jeremiah 23, 5 through 6 tells us that Jesus would be from the line of David, which he was. Micah 5, 2 reminds us Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, which he did, he was. Isaiah 7, 14 tells us that Jesus would be born from a virgin, which he did. Isaiah, or, um, Isaiah 9, 6 through 7 tells us a child would be born and the government would be on his shoulders, which it was. Psalm 72.10 tells us that Jesus would be worshipped and given gifts at his birth, which he was. Jeremiah 31.15 tells us that King Herod would murder children in an attempt to kill Jesus, which happened. And lastly, Hosea 11.1 1 tells us that Joseph would, be, Joseph would be warned to take Jesus to Egypt for a time to protect him, which he did. All of these prophecies came true exactly how God had planned them and told them thousands of years before. God had this all worked up. He had a plan. I always wonder what the people, especially what the Jewish people were thinking after they saw Jesus alive. The ones who thought that he was just faking all this, that he couldn't have been the Messiah because it wasn't how they had, had it pictured. A few weeks ago, I uh, had the chance to go to a really big ball game. Now, most of you know I'm a big sports fan. I'm a big uh, Notre Dame uh, uh, football fan. And I've been to a number of games over the years. I had a, uh, a nurse practice or a, a physician assistant, a dermatologist that um, I work with that went to Notre, Notre Dame. And she asked me, she goes, I have tickets for this really big game the next day. It's Clemson and Notre Dame at Notre Dame Stadium. Now, Clemson is a big name. They were top five ranked at the time, and it was going to be a really big deal. 
It was the next day. She said her husband was sick, and she goes, I don't think I can use these tickets. I have two tickets for the Saturday night game, and I've also got a hotel uh, reserved if you'd like them. And now normally I would jump at this. I love going to games, and I would find any reason to go to this game. But a couple things made me stop. First of all, I thought, okay, I actually do have plans the next night. So this was the night of the center chicken noodle dinner, um, which I even talked to my wife when I was sharing. I, I, you know, it's one of those things you just throw it out there and say, you know, I got invited these to this game. What do you think? And she said right away, she goes, it's chicken noodle dinner. You're fine if you want to go to the game. She gave me approval right away. But then I thought, okay, it's Saturday night. I preach downstairs uh, to Beach Grove United Methodist Church every Sunday morning. And I'm thinking this is going to be a long drive the next morning, even though it was the time change that weekend. And um, it was the time change, and I would have to have this long drive. I'd have an extra hour. But honestly, what it came down to is this. <laughs> Notre Dame had lost its starting quarterback the first, after the, actually the, the second game of the season. They had been on a backup, and they would had some really tough losses throughout the year. And I'm thinking, if I go to this game, this night game, there's going to be a ton of these other Clemson fans who are probably going to lose big. I'm going to, it's going to be terrible being around all those people. Then the drive on top of that, it's like, I just don't want to go through that. So I just, I told her, you know, I do have plans. I'm not going to be able to use those tickets. And she actually, she ended up going with her dad, which is good for her. Because the next day, if you don't know, I was watching the game that night. Notre Dame went up a touchdown in the first quarter. Then they go up two touchdowns. And I'm thinking, okay, and I'm an optimist, but even then I'm thinking, okay, when, when's it going to come? They're going to come back. They're going to win because they're a top five team, and we're not. We kept building on that lead. The entire game, Notre Dame dominated that game. So much so that when the game was over, most of the fans stormed the field. I could have been on that field. <laughs> this is a picture of the field that I've never been on. Hindsight is 2020. Do I wish I would have gone? Absolutely. I could have had tickets to this game, but no, I thought I knew what was going to happen. Just like the Jewish people, the Israelites figured they knew what the Messiah was going to be like. But when they saw Jesus back alive, they're like, what did we do? Jesus is often right beside us in our times that we're lonely, in despair, having no idea that he's there walking beside us, just like the two men. You know, I've, I've shared many stories over the past few years about our ice cream coffee shop, his place, and, and, and I've shared how it was the time of my life where I've never felt more in despair, more in fear of what was going to happen because early on in the life of this business, I knew it was going to fail. We had enough signs, we lost enough money that I knew this was not going to be the success that I predicted. Now, there were so many times during this year that we were open that I thought, God, I know you're going to turn this around because this is a Christian business. We wrote scripture. We prayed on the cement floor before we put the hardwood floor down. We have live Christian music that I know you want people to hear. We're, we're, we're doing so many things for the name of the Lord. So we know, I know you want this to work. But it wasn't. And I couldn't understand why God wasn't allowing this to work because I thought I was doing it the way he wanted me to do it. He was with me during that time, and I, and I never lost faith or, or lost trust in him, but I wondered why wasn't this working out the way I thought it should. Even though I know his ways are greater than my ways and his thoughts are higher than my thoughts, as the heaven is the earth, we've been told that he knows much more than me, thank goodness, but why wasn't this working out? Little did I know a few years, years later that I would get stirred from the Holy Spirit to go to seminary that I would have never thought to have done before, or that I'd be, uh, become a, a pastor, that I would be preaching here that we never saw coming. That wouldn't have happened if God hadn't to take, take me out of this, this store that I thought should have been successful in a different way. He was with me during those times. You see, Jesus is often right beside us in those times. We know his ways are higher. We need to understand that. And one of the amazing things about who God is is he does not make us love him or follow him. We have our own free will. We have the choice as badly as he wants us with him in eternity in heaven. He gives us our choice. He's not going to force us to follow him. That's up to us. But that's why he sent his only son to this earth as, a, as fully human here in this earth 
because he knew the only way we could have an eternity with him is by sacrificing his son on this cross for us. And they were told. They were told that someday Messiah would come back. We're told right now that Jesus said he's going to come back and he will be the judge in the earth. We don't know when that's going to be. He came in the form of a sacrifice so that we all could be with God. And I want to end with the scripture, Isaiah 9, 6, the full scripture. And this is the one we think of so often when we think of Christmas. He goes, for to us a child is born and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So I just ask you tonight, choose tonight to follow him even when the outcome isn't what you'd hoped for, even when it isn't what you expected. Trust in the one God who gave up everything for you. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the prophets. <laughs> I thank you for so many promises that we take for granted. We think we can do things our way, and sometimes they're better than your ways. Help us, help me learn to trust you in tough times and know that, you know, if we just put our full trust in you and say, God, what do you want me to do? That you have a perfect plan laid out for us. And even when we go through tough times, because we know this earth, this earth is a fallen earth. We know there's going to be trouble on this earth. You warned us about that. But we're here for such a short time compared to eternity. Help us through our tough times. Walk with us just like you did those disciples so many years ago, let us know that you're with us. It's in the powerful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. As I still believe in your faithfulness, Oh, holy 
child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Oh, come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. First of all, next week. Next week, of course, we're going to have the free, we're having a free pizza, pizza dinner after the service. We'd love for you to, to come and invite people to come with you and fellowship. But we're going to talk about what the, the um, birth of Christ was like from Mary's perspective. We're going to look at a different perspective and think, what was she going through as a teenager at the time? And we're going to keep celebrating through Christmas songs and others. But I, I was just thinking as the song was play, being played, I know people in this room are really struggling with a number of issues right now. And I know those issues are, are, are varied, but just know that when you're struggling with those, whether it's the Christmas season or beyond, think of the, the disciples who were walking to Emmaus. Think that Jesus is walking there with you. Trust in him. Talk to him. Pray and have a communication with him. He wants you to, to know that he's there for you. Go in peace. In the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>